back to our closing keynote to close out an amazing day of Phil Fest. We started out with two hours of programming for the Coindesk live stream. We saw so many amazing announcements, so many new developments on the network. And now we're gonna wrap it all up with one of the core contributors to the Filecoin protocol, Molly McKinley. She is the CEO of Phil Oz, a newly, learned, newly launched uh, ecosystem project. And she's gonna share priorities for the network, where we are now, where we're going, basically everything you need to know to get started with Filecoin. So take it away, Molly. Thank you. All right, hello friends. Um, we'll see, maybe, maybe not everything, but I'm excited to run through a little bit of kind of where Filecoin is coming from, where I see some of the biggest opportunities in 2024, and some of the very exciting things that are in the works um, that maybe you'll be hearing about in a deeper dive in the next two days at PhilDev Summit, um, about all of the, the new building blocks, the new things that are launching in network version 23, codenamed Waffle, that is gonna be rolling out uh, end of July, beginning of August, um, and uh, some of the other really amazing amazing things that we can work on together to bring into the Filecoin ecosystem. Um, so all of this starts with the mission of Filecoin. What really unites us, brings us together, is why we're, we're wor working on and building this decentralized storage network. Uh, and that's our goal, to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. Um, that's what Filecoin has and always will be about, um, really supporting core human needs, supporting humanity's information, making a robust foundation that other people can build on top of, that supports an entire ecosystem of builders and projects and different on-ramps, um, and that is truly decentralized, efficient, and can work on replacing the centralized storage systems that many people rely on and are frustrated with today. Um, Many folks here might have seen the kind of organization of this long-term mission of Filecoin into three main steps. The first one, building the world's largest decentralized storage network, which Filecoin actually accomplished within its first year of life. We're now um, three years into the Filecoin mainnet, um, and it just continues to be amazing to see the scale of Filecoin's decentralized storage capacity. Um, step two was onboarding and safeguarding humanity's data, and we're still in the midst of this, making sure that Filecoin can reach all of the different users and use cases across Web 2, Web 3, large-scale enterprises, um, open source data sets, um, you name it, it should be onboarded and stored robustly on Filecoin. And then step three, integrating Filecoin into compute networks, making it available to program on top of Filecoin and power web scale applications that are backed by Filecoin's decentralized storage. Um, and that's where you've seen a lot of growth around FVM, where we see new layer twos bringing compute networks to build on top of Filecoin, um, and now new hot storage networks that are augmenting and composing with Filecoin L1 to expand the entire Filecoin ecosystem and become new backends for future D-PIN networks, offering them scalable storage, authentication, um, and compute. So I'd mentioned this is one of the things that most excites me and I think is so meaningful to the entire Filecoin community is the large scale client adoption that's happened across Filecoin, supporting groups like UC Berkeley, the Victor Chang Institute, CERN's Aslet, As Atlas project and many others who are onboarding their data onto Filecoin. And we've seen many of these large scale groups um, come and find value, not just in having a lower cost storage medium, but one that is verifiable, that has, um, kind of chains of authenticity and proofs of that data over time so you can see the custody of data um, long term, use it in things like um, you know, showing the, the custody and the, the growth of a data set or when that data set was first onboarded and being able to verify it's the same as when you download it later or being able to use it in Web3 contexts where you're fetching a decentralized data set from a decentralized storage network. Um, and I, I think this is the core of what we have done and what we need to continue doing within the Filecoin ecosystem is scaling that client adoption. FVM was a huge step forward for us, launched uh, just over a year ago, um, unleashing 
all of the potential of builders and application developers to augment and compose with Filecoin using a um, programming layer to write uh, EVM compatible smart contracts, deploy them on Filecoin and enable and unlock new possibilities. And even just in the last HackFS hackathon, which wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, we saw so many cool applications being built with FVM. Um, a couple of, of my favorite use cases, uh, and many of the, the HackFS projects fell in these categories as well. Um, we see a lot of really cool work around perpetual, automatic, or, or hyper-tuned storage use cases that are um, scaling to onboard different data sets with um, maybe pools of storage providers or using cross-chain um, automatic storage payments. Um, that's been a really cool area to see. Um, there's a lot of new compute and Gen AI networks and now layer twos that are being built. Um, we'll mention Fluence in a second, but uh, seeing these groups really building on and with Filecoin so that you can compose large-scale storage with you know, compute that can modify and make that data highly useful um, is also a very exciting use case that FEMs unlocked. Um, and we've also seen groups doing things like DeFi loan markets, retrieval contracts. There's a new, a new initiative to write a smart contract for um, like retrieval bounties and security so that you can have insurance that your data will be retrievable on, on FEM. Um, so th this has really unlocked a lot of user programmability. And when I look forward to Filecoin in 2024, um, harnessing last year's upgrades really unlocks the next stage for Filecoin. So we've succeeded in onboarding large scale data sets. We've succeeded in um, scaling a programmable storage layer for Filecoin. And now it's about doing that faster, simpler, for more different use cases um, and, and unlocking a larger scale ecosystem building on top of that. Um, so these are, this is a slide that um, I think Juan Bennett presented in uh, Istanbul at the, I guess last, Phil Istanbul, I guess, uh, a couple, um, about six months ago, um, looking forward to 2024 and some of the um, you know, goals that the Filecoin network as a community um, could have for uh, what to focus on this year. Um, one of those is focusing on the, the storage use case around retrieval, making sure that we can be supporting all of the clients and users in the wider ecosystem that desire not just an archival copy of their data, but they want to serve their website off of their Filecoin storage, or they want it to back their NFT, or they, they want a, a hot storage guarantee, um, kind of like you would host your bucket out of S3. And so that's been a, a key thing both for Filecoin L1, but also for layer twos that are adding even faster um, more mutable layers on top of Filecoin L1. Um, there's also a lot more work that's happening at that on-ramp layer, scaling them for different use cases, um, focusing them on different sizes of data. A lot of the work from uh, 2023 was really large scale data sets. And this year actually the focus has been more on what about that aggregation layer? What about web three data sets where you both want um, hot data, but you want things of more in the, you know, couple hundred gigabytes to couple terabytes size of, um, you know, for us, that's smaller data sets in this world. Uh, I know that's not small for, for all of the web, but you know, when we're talking about 100 petabyte data sets um, elsewhere, that's actually you know, more the scale that we're talking about when we talk about Web3 users or deep pin networks that are harnessing Filecoin. Um, there's been a big focus on enabling users that are coming to Filecoin and paying for the storage that they're using. Um, in the early days of Filecoin, no one had much trust in the, the robustness of the Filecoin network, so um, many groups were you know, willing to bring their data here, but they weren't willing to pay very much for it. And we've really seen that shifting over time. Um, now we have you know, 30 plus uh, clients in the queue who are paying five to seven to even more um, terabytes Per, uh, dollars per terabyte per month, um, which is pretty good. And so we're really starting to see that demand pick up. Um, but that also means a lot more um, expectation from those users about making sure their data is kind of robustly monitored. Um, there's been a lot of work happening around uh, retrieval monitoring and um, overall making sure that the, the user experience of onboarding your data on Filecoin works really nicely. Um, then there's kind of a, a chunks of work around high value applications and compute networks and, and enabling this whole set of L2s on Filecoin um, that can bring more robust services into the Filecoin economy and compose with Filecoin storage as well. 
Um, so I mentioned the file clean economy a couple of times in here. What do I mean by that? Um, overall, you can see different segments, different market segments of the file coin economy, um, kind of depending on um, the overall scales of data that they're bringing into the ecosystem, the, the ways in which they contribute back to the core economy. Um, I actually find this diagram super useful to think about. I'll break it down in a second, but um, thinking of the economy as something that has internal businesses, it exports value through things like the storage that it provides, um, maybe the, the FEM block space that it provides. Uh, it imports the work of all of the storage providers, all of the developers, all of the community members that help grow the Filecoin ecosystem. And then it has um, different kind of internal consumption mechanisms where um, you know, F gas is used for um, FEM transactions or um, for layer two uh, checkpoints or things like that. Um, and, and thinking about that economy as we think about those overall goals, it really, to me, con congeals into three main areas um, of, of focus areas that will overall grow the whole Filecoin economy while also helping us achieve Filecoin's core mission. Um, there's increasing the overall paid adoption of the system that is through offering services that people are excited to pay for, like reliable, hot, fast storage, um, having smooth storage on-ramps with good UX for users to onboard quickly, tuned for their use case. So Basin might be offering a different UX for deep pin networks versus what Storacha is optimizing for media and gaming and social applications. Um, and that we're specifically focused on paying storage clients, um, which means that we have a, a subset of the previous larger community of storage clients that we're spending our, our time with because we're spending our time where, where folks are paying. Um, there's also a chunk of work that's been happening on lowering overall network costs. There are so many new storage provider focused cost reductions that are landing in the next network upgrade. NV23 is like a gem if you're a storage provider. Um, there's brand new um, non-interactive PoRap, which helps with sealing as a service. Um, there's now Super Seal, which allows you to kind of uh, quickly do large scale updates to sectors. Um, there's a lot of really good goodies that overall reduce what the Filecoin ecosystem needs to pay for um, the, the work that's being done to push the network forward. Um, there's also been really cool work on efficiently funding all of the public goods work in the Filecoin ecosystem through things like Retro PGF, um, which is a way that the network as a whole can identify and value um, the awesome work being done across many verticals of the ecosystem and allocate its collective resources. Um, Last but not least, increasing, util increasing utilization. This is around bringing more high value ap applications, supporting all of the FVM builders who are um, you know, bringing things like drips and snapshot and uh, easy retro PGF into the Filecoin ecosystem so that we can benefit from those applications. But those applications are also default aligned with the growth of the Filecoin economy and are happening kind of in on-chain transactions, usage, payments um, that are, are flowing through and within that economy. All right, so how do I break these down into these growth areas? Um, the first, obviously, is really around L2s. All of these both cause more demand for Filecoin L1 checkpointing and storage, but they also bring more economic activity into the Filecoin ecosystem and offer new services and applications that Filecoin can um, then export to its wider community of users. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening here. Um, really FVM unlocked this new phase. Before FVM, there wasn't a way to build L2s on top of Filecoin. Um, and IPC is really the, the technology that people use these days um, to build a new L2. And they're highly tuned for um, deep pin networks, compute networks, modular networks where you wanna be running, say something like a, a custom WASM proof or um, get, get up and going very quickly with even a separate subnet for every different client you're onboarding. Um, and this is kind of a, a revolutionary new technology that was developed in the Filecoin ecosystem, tuned around the use cases that we both experienced as developers in Filecoin, but we're hearing from groups like Fluence and Basin and other groups that wanted to build their own networks, but without having to build their entire own layer one stack. 
Um, and IPC is really designed around this concept of subnets. You can have application-specific subnets, like a gaming subnet. You can have ones that are focused on databases. You can even have regional subnets, where you're breaking down between US, Europe, Asia, and permissioning who gets to join those subnets um, based on where they are in the world. And, and this model really is taking the concept of blockchains and turning them into something much more modular, something like a process that you're running within your machine. Um, and, and the point of that is that these subnets are also hyper-tunable. Um, the whole module of, of FBM was to have these different runtimes. The first one was the um, FEVM, that's EVM compatible, but you can plug in your own runtime into FVM um, and have the F Wasm or F Solana VM or F Aqua VM or whatever uh, VM makes sense for your, your use case, you can bring that into your subnet. You can also have things like custom gas schedules, um, custom tokens, um, custom consensus mechanisms. Um, it's, it's your own subnet. You can tune it the way that you want. Um, and this can really support a whole ecosystem of service networks that are building on Filecoin with IPC um, to power all of these different use cases that we see composing very tightly with the value of storage and with the hardware that you're bringing to bear across all of these different service networks. Um, I haven't heard that many people talking about this, but I highly believe that the future of blockchain is gonna be one where you're not choosing one single um, vertical and you're like, great, I do Solana, and like I do Solana L1, and that's the only thing that my nodes do. No, we're gonna be a, in a world where you're multi-noding, you're participating with the same um, service node across multiple different networks, and there's a value add there because you can then more seamlessly compose your data storage, your compute network, your deep pin indexing, aggregation, mapping, whatever network, all together um, by being a node that, that bridges these different networks and pulls them together locally on a single set of hardware. Um, so I think that's gonna be a, a huge boon of something so modular and simple like IPC. We already actually had the first um, L2 went live on Filecoin using IPC. Um, Fluence launched their mainnet back in, uh, it was March, um, around East Denver, which has been super exciting. Um, and we already see the next two, maybe three um, L2s coming, building on top of IPC. Um, Staracha and Basin have, I definitely know, are using it. I think Akave as well. Um, but it's really amazing to see all of these um, new data on-ramps also utilizing and adopting um, these new technologies that can allow them to have a much more kind of organic structure where you can literally spin up a different subnet for every large-scale deep pin network you're onboarding, like what Basin is doing where they have a different network for WeatherXM and uh, Demo and every different network they're working with, um, which I think is very smart and very scalable and um, kind of more modular in that way. Um, and I think it's also very true that we shouldn't expect to have one size fits all for all of the different applications and on-ramps that will exist in Filecoin land. Many of these will evolve into L2s. Some of them won't, um, but we'll have an entire ecosystem of different um, groups that are targeting different specific use cases and have optimized their UX in that way. Um, and you can see a little bit, you know, some groups are focused on, you know, Web3 chain state data. Some folks are targeting off-chain deep in and compute data. Um, but through it all, we're, we're kind of looking at the, the entire ecosystem uh, across the board. All right, moving on from L2s to, okay, what's actually happening at uh, L1 at the Filecoin adoption services exports land. Um, so when I think about Filecoin, I think a lot about the storage and retrieval lifecycle. Um, if you haven't thought about it, this is kind of how storage clients work with different on-ramps, move their data down to storage providers, that data gets indexed and made accessible um, and, and kind of like retrievable through that indexing process. And then you have retrieval providers and retrieval clients. Um, so you store and then you retrieve. Um, and there's been a lot of you know, service improvements that have been happening around how people 
can store data into Filecoin. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is F3, which is, stands for Filecoin Fast Finality. Um, it's a, a massive speed up in how people can bring um, new kind of on-chain storage contracts from many other networks to interface with the Filecoin network um, without having to wait a super long time for their transactions to finalize or to um, bridge liquidity or other things into the ecosystem. Um, I think there's a really cool opportunity at this point in time to start thinking about stable coins that might be used in um, you know, on-chain markets or um, other ways of kind of upgrading the storage services, harnessing this new upgrade that's landing in the next network upgrade um, and is now gonna become available within Filecoin. Um, I'd mentioned also there were a lot of improvements to the storage onboarding process. Um, the, the new like sector as a service, um, uh, Onboarding flow is also landing quickly, which is decreasing overall the cost and latency of data onboarding in Filecoin. There's also Super Seal, which also accelerates and uh, makes that whole onboarding pathway much cheaper. Um, all of these Web3 data onboarding ramps that are focused on different use cases. Um, and there's some really cool new, like if you, if you don't even want to build a layer two and you just want to put your data on ramp in a fully decentralized smart contract that's just running inside of FBM, there's now a smart contract template for that. So you can do cross chain storage deals. Um, you can harness F3 to bring that to any other network. So you're doing a Filecoin storage deal from Solana or Ethereum or Arbitrum or Optimism or wherever. On the retrieval side, we've also seen a lot of progress here in the last you know, couple of months. Um, Spark retrieval checking rolled out in, I think it was like January, February of this year, and it's now auditing all Filecoin Plus deals for retrievability actively. Um, we have over 30 storage providers with over an 80% retrieval success rate. This goes up and down, sometimes it's over 90, sometimes it's over 80%, but pretty good. Um, on average, of the storage providers that are offering retrievals, we have about a 50% retrieval success rate through the, the Spark retrieval checking. It's not bad, but we have work to do. That's not good enough. And really, overall, this is where we have the biggest um, you know, gap to continue closing. Um, as you can see, the difference between 50% and 4%, the vast majority of storage providers are not offering retrieval, even for their Filecoin Plus data. And if they're not gonna offer retrieval for it, this is data that the network is helping subsidize and pay for um, so that it can be available and useful to the entire community. Um, you know, that's, that's data where those storage providers aren't stepping up to their side of the, the Filecoin Plus bargain to make that data uh, accessible and useful. And so, um, you know, either that 4% retrieval success rate overall needs to go up, or those storage providers aren't going to be getting more access to Filecoin Plus, and there might even be, um, you know, future uh, improvements that are incorporating this retrieval success metric into the overall um, you know, picture of how we reward data in that program. Um, but this is also really good news because there is now an open dashboard at philspark.app, I think, where you can go and look up, all right, who are the storage providers that I can rely on that are gonna give me really good retrieval success rates and I can choose to work with them and not others. And so we can flow our resources and our clients as a network to those who are really stepping up to the overall goal of storing humanity's most important information. Um, there's also been some really awesome improvements overall to the Filecoin Plus allocator system. Um, it is doing a better job of tracking these retrieval success metrics. We've seen this like over uh, 2.5x improvement just in the past quarter of, of retrievability, um, really thanks to like tying the loop of like, hey, if you're going to participate in this program, you need to um, step up to the responsibilities. Um, and there's a new uh, FIP um, discussion out there that we're actually going to prototype via a smart contract instead of having to do first as a core network upgrade um, that's called PDP or proof of data possession. It's a hot storage proof. So instead of having to do a long seal, unseal process every time you want to access the data with PDP, it's instantaneous. It keeps your data unsealed. So you can't prove that you have X many copies of the data because you can just fetch the data from a single copy, but it can prove that you have at least one hot copy accessible and you can return your retrieval request from that, which is a really good additional model module to bring into the Filecoin ecosystem, which will allow us to then start composing that with other Filecoin proofs to have provable hot and cold storage tiers, which is pretty cool. Um, 
I still think we have work to go though. I think there's additional service export opportunities that we're not hitting yet. And I would love to talk to people that are maybe excited about taking some of these on, come to FilDev Summit, we can do some of the design work together. Um, one of these is working more on on-chain paid storage deals. Um, we now have a lot of clients who are paying for their uh, data storage in Filecoin, but most of them are paying for it directly to the storage provider in cash instead of paying in on-chain fill deals. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, but we should start with having make, making sure that we have good on-chain native payment channels so that we can bring those, um, those payments on-chain and be part of the Filecoin ecosystem. The second part of that is stable coins. Um, one of the things that is a friction point there is the volatility of you know, any token price in um, thinking about a one or three or five plus year storage deal into the future. I'd rather denominate that in a, um, you know, a stable coin backed currency. And so I think this is a really interesting opportunity to think about how we might build a file coin or fill backed stablecoin, something like DAI, um, that would enable clients and storage providers to do those on-chain payments, but in a stablecoin so they're not exposed to that uh, volatility. We also continue, we have an amazing overlap between the Filecoin ecosystem and the DSI community, a lot of shared goals and interests. Um, I'd really like to see um, even more groups who are thinking about how we um, enable large-scale uh, academic data sets or DSI data sets um, to very easily flow through Filecoin and, and be kind of absorbed and make use of Filecoin's um, low cost verifiable storage services. Um, uh, another thing we mentioned here is, is storage tiers. I think it is about time that we clearly delineate different uh, storage tiers within something like the Filecoin Plus program, um, but also to clients and users in different on-ramps. Like if you're, um, you know, having your archival copy and you don't expect to fetch it, you know, more than once every six months or once a year or once every three years, um, that's one tier. If you're having it being checked by the Spark Retrieval Checker on a weekly or monthly basis, then that's a different tier. Um, and if you've actually now done, you know, high scale redundancy and you have maybe collateral from many storage providers that yes, they're gonna serve you those retrievals, that's maybe another tier as well. And so I think we could structure those um, together to make it, uh, you know, a, a, an easy mental model for folks, for clients when they come to the, the Filecoin network. Um, there's also some really interesting work being done on the intersection of storage and compute APIs. Um, there's a lot of deep end networks and compute networks like Fluence that are already building on top of Filecoin and having really good reusable building blocks that can help you uh, interface between your Filecoin storage and your compute job that you want to send to the storage provider that already has that data. Um, I think there's some, some building blocks that are missing there that would really um, ease that integration point uh, for everyone. And so we'd love to talk to folks that are interested in that. Um, last but not least, there's a really interesting idea that you're going to have to come talk to me at the FilDev Summit tomorrow if you want to learn more about, but it's this forward-looking vision for um, how the Filecoin ecosystem and market grows beyond just a single L1 chain, but can really pervade all of the L2s that are building on Filecoin and also help all of them export their storage and compute and deep in services across all of Web3. And it's this idea called Filecoin Web Services, which if you're familiar with Amazon Web Services, is a hub for paying for all sorts of different um, you know, service components and composing them together easily. Um, and we think this is a, a potential opportunity that we're still exploring and would love to talk with you about um, to help Filecoin bring all of these deep end services, make it easy for users to compose them together with their storage and compute needs um, and make that accessible on every other Web3 chain so that you can do this easily on Ethereum, Solana, Cosmos, wherever. So if you have other ideas of additional services Filecoin should be exporting to the world, come talk to me um, and maybe we can brainstorm and work on it together at FilDev Summit. All right, last but not least, almost out of time, is really around scaling the Filecoin economy. Um, there's a, a lot of opportunity here um, in decreasing the network-wide OPEX. We talked about some of the you know, massive reductions to um, SP deal-making OPEX. Um, there's now DDO that's live, Super Seal and NI Rep are going live later this month. Um, and there's also some work around um, ReSnap and, and other um, initiatives that are really helping 
overall the network um, you know, save costs on our storage hardware. Um, there's also more work that's happening around onboarding paying users to Filecoin storage. Um, I think Jen was on this stage earlier today talking about the many PIBs of enterprise paid storage deals that they are uh, helping onboard and match make with different storage providers and on-ramps across the ecosystem. Um, and having Spark uh, Retrieval Metrics Live also helps us offer a new kind of retrieval guarantee tier um, to many different users of Filecoin storage. Um, and last but not least, we have a uh, growing uh, DeFi DEX market. Um, and with fast finality, that creates a whole new opportunity for cross-chain liquidity, bridging, um, and interop with Filecoin for new DeFi businesses. Um, also wanted to give a, a quick shout out. If you are building in the Filecoin ecosystem or interested in starting building in the Filecoin e ecosystem, we just ran our first uh, retro PGF program in Filecoin, which allocated um, over 200,000 fill distributed to 99 different teams and open source projects um, rewarded for their public goods contribution to the space. Um, and that both is uh, a win for all of the amazing builders here to be recognized for that great work. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to give back by putting those resources to work on behalf of the Filecoin community. Um, and it also um, is a maybe more effective way of thinking about how we collectively as a community value and reward the work that, that grows the ecosystem. Um, so um, I'm Molly, please come chat with me. Let's make Filecoin better together. And hopefully some of you uh, join us at the PhilDev Summit tomorrow. It's just a seven minute walk that way. And we'd love to talk more about all the ways we can keep improving Filecoin. Cheers.